The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Great. So last week, um, or last uh, few lectures, uh, you heard about parallel architectures and uh, started with uh, lecture four on discussions of concurrency. How do you take applications or uh, independent actors that want to operate on the same data and make them run safely together? And so just recapping uh, the last two lectures, uh, you saw really two primary classes of architectures, although Samad talked about a few more. Uh, there was the class of shared memory processors, um, you know, the multi-cores that Intel and AMD and PowerPC, for example, have today, uh, where you have one copy of the data, and that's really shared among all the different processors because they essentially share the same memory. And you have uh, things like, or you need things like atomicity and synchronization to be able to make sure that the sharing uh, is done properly so that you don't get into rate, uh, uh, data race situations uh, where multiple processors try to update the same data element and you end up with erroneous results. Um, you also heard about distributed memory processors. So an example of that might be uh, the cell, uh, loosely said, uh, where you have cores that primarily access their own local memory. And if they, uh, while you can have uh, a single global memory address space, to get data from memory, you essentially have to communicate uh, with the different processors to explicitly fetch data in and out. So things like data distribution, uh, where the data is, and what your communication pattern is like affect your performance. <coughs> so what I'm going to talk about in today's lecture um, is programming these two different kinds of architectures, shared memory processors and distributed memory processors, um, and present you with some concepts uh, for, for commonly programming these machines. So in shared memory processors, you have, say, n processors, one to n, and they're connected to a single memory. And if one processor asks for the value stored at address x, everybody knows where it'll go look, because there's only one address x. And so you can communicate, so different processors can communicate through shared variables, and you need things like uh, locking, as I mentioned, to avoid uh, race conditions or erroneous computation. Uh, so in this example of parallelization, you know, straightforward parallelization uh, in a shared memory machine would be you have this simple loop that's just running through um, an array and you're adding elements of array A to elements of array B. And you're going to write them to uh, some new array C. Well, if I gave you this loop, you can probably recognize that there's really no data dependencies here. Uh, I can split up this loop into three chunks. Let's say I have three processors where one processor does all the computations for iterations one through uh, zero through three, so the first four iterations. Second processor does the next four iterations. And the third processor does the last four iterations. And so that's shown um, on, uh, with the uh, little, uh, should probably leave the pointer. So that's shown here. And what you might need to do is some mechanism to essentially tell the different processors, here's the code that you need to run and maybe where to start. And then you may need some way of sort of synchronizing these different processors that say, I'm done. I can move on to the next computation steps. So this is an example of a data parallel computation. The loop has no real dependencies. And you know, each processor can operate on different data sets. And what you can do is you can have a process. Uh, this is a single application um, that, uh, that forks off or creates what's, what are commonly called the threads. And each thread goes on and executes, in this case, the same computation. So a single process can create multiple concurrent threads. And really, each thread is just a mechanism for encapsulating uh, some, some trace of execution, some execution path. So in this case, you're essentially uh, encapsulating this particular loop here. And maybe you parameterize your start index your, uh, and your ending index, or maybe your iteration bounds, uh, your loop bounds. And in a shared memory processor, since you're communicating, uh, since there's only a single memory, uh, really they can, you don't need to do anything special about the data in this, in this particular example, because everybody knows where to go look for it. Everybody can access it. Everything's independent. There's no real issues with races or deadlocks. Uh, so I just wrote down some actual code uh, 
uh, for that loop that parallelize it using p-threads, a uh, commonly used threading mechanism. Just to give you a little bit of flavor for uh, you know, the complexity of the simple loop that we had expands to a lot more code in this case. So you have your array. It has 12 elements, uh, A, B, and C. And you have the basic function. So this is the actual code or computation that we want to carry out. And what I've done here is I've parameterized where you're essentially starting in the array. Uh, so you get this parameter, and then you calculate four iterations worth. And this is the essential computation that we're carrying out. And now in my main program, or in my main function, rather, uh, what I do is I have this concept of uh, threads that I'm going to create. Uh, in this case, I'm going to create three of them. Uh, there, there are some parameters that I have to pass in, so some attributes, uh, which I'm not going to get into here. But then I pass in the function pointer. This is essentially a mechanism that says, once I've created this thread, I go to this function and execute this particular code. And then some arguments to the function. So here I'm just passing in the index at which each loop switch start with. And after I've created each thread, here implicitly in the thread creation, the code can just immediately start running. And then once all the threads have started running, I can essentially just uh, uh, exit the program because I've completed. So what I've shown you is that, that first example was a concept of, uh, or an example of data parallelism. So you perform the same computation, but uh, instead of operating on one big chunk of data, I've partitioned the data into smaller chunks, and I've passed it on to, uh, I've replicated the computation so that I can get that kind of parallelism. Uh, but you can, there's another form of parallelism called control parallelism, which uh, essentially uses the same model of threading, uh, but doesn't necessarily have to uh, run the same function or run the same computation in each thread. So I've sort of illustrated that in the, in the illustration there, where these are your data parallel computations, and these are some other uh, computations in your code. Okay. So there is uh, sort of a programming model that allows you to do this kind of parallelism uh, with, uh, and tries to uh, sort of help uh, the programmer by taking their sequential code and then adding annotations that say, this loop is data parallel, or this set of code uh, is task, uh, has this kind of uh, con um, control parallelism in it. So you, you start with your uh, parallel code. This is the same program, multiple data kind of uh, parallelization. So you might have seen in the previous talk and the previous lecture, it was SIMD, single instruction or same instruction, multiple data, which allowed you to execute the same operation, uh, you know, an add over multiple data elements. So here it's uh, a similar kind of terminology. There's the same program, multiple data, and multiple programs, multiple data. This talk is largely focused on the SPMV model, uh, where you essentially have one central decision maker, uh, or you're trying to solve one central computation and you're trying to parallelize that over your architecture to get the best performance. So you start off with uh, your program, and then you annotate the code with what's parallel and what's not parallel. And you might add in some synchronization directives uh, so that if you do, in fact, have sharing, you might want to use the right locking mechanism uh, to uh, guarantee safety. Now, in OpenMP, uh, th there are some limitations as to what it can do. So it, it in fact, assumes that the programmer knows what he's doing. And the programmer is largely responsible for getting the synchronization right, or that if they're sharing, that they get those dependencies uh, protected correctly. Um, so you can take your program, insert these annotations, and then you uh, go on and test and debug. So a simple OpenMP example, again, using the simple loop. Um, now I've thrown away some of the extra code. You add in these two extra pragmas in this case. The first one, uh, you know, the parallel pragma, um, I call the data parallel pragma, really says that you can execute as many of the following code or the following uh, code block as there are processors or as many as you have thread context. So in this case, I have, you know, I've implicitly made the assumption that I have three processors, so you can automatically partition my code into uh, three sets. And this transformation can sort of be done automatically by the compiler. And then there's a four pragma that says, um, this loop is parallel, and you can divide up the work um, in, in, in a mechanism that's work sharing. So multiple threads can collaborate to solve the same computation, uh, but each one does a smaller amount of work. So this is in contrast to uh, what I'm going to focus on a lot more in the rest of the talk, which is distributed memory processors and programming for distributed memories. 
And this will feel a lot more uh, uh, like programming for the cell as you get more and more involved in that and your projects get uh, more intense. So in distributed memory processor, to, uh, uh, <coughs> to recap uh, the previous lectures, you have n processors. Each processor has its own memory. And they essentially share the interconnection network. So you have uh, each processor has its own address x. So when a processor P1 asks for x, it knows where to lo go look. It's going to look in its own local memory. So if all processors are asking for the same address or for the same value that's stored at address x, and each one goes and looks in a different place. Um, so there are n places to look, really. And what's stored in those addresses will vary because it's everybody's local memory. So if one processor, say P1, wants to look at uh, the value stored in processor 2's address, it actually has to explicitly request it. The processor 2 has to send it data, and processor 1 has to figure out you know, what to do with that copy. So it has to store it somewhere. So this message passing uh, really uses uh, or exposes explicit communication to exchange data. And uh, you'll see that there, there's different kinds of data communications, uh, but really the concept of what you exchange has three different, uh, or four different, rather, um, things you need to address. One is, what is the, how is the data described and what does it describe? How are the processes identified? So how do I identify that processor one is sending me this data? And if I'm receiving data, how do I know who I'm receiving it from? Um, does, are all messages the same? Well, you know, if I send a message to somebody, do I have any guarantees that it's received or not? Um, and what does it mean for a send operation or a receive operation to be completed? You know, is there some sort of acknowledgment um, process? So an example of a message processing program, and if you've started to look at the lab, you'll see that this is essentially the, uh, uh, this is where the lab came from, or the two, uh, you know, it's, it's the same idea. I've created, here I have some two-dimensional space, and I have points in this two-dimensional space. I have points B, which are these blue circles, and I have points A, which I've represented as these uh, yellow or golden squares. <coughs> and what I want to do is, for every point in A, I want to calculate the distance to all other points B. So there's a, sort of a pairwise interaction between the two arrays. So a simple loop that essentially does this, uh, you know, and there are n squared interact. Uh, well, yeah, <coughs> n squared interactions. You have you know, a loop that loops over all the A elements, a loop that loops over all the B elements, and you essentially calculate, in this case, Euclidean distance, which I'm not showing. And you store that into some new array. So if I give you two processors to do this work, uh, processor one and processor two, and I give you some mechanism to share between the two. So here's my CPU. Here's each processor's local memory. What would be some approach for actually parallelizing this? Anybody look at the lab yet? OK, so what would you do with two processors? <laughs> right, so you split, so what we said is that you split one of the arrays in two, and you can actually get that kind of concurrency. So you know, let's say processor one uh, already has data, and it has some place that it's already allocated where it's going to write C. Uh, the results of the computation, then I can break up the work just like uh, it was suggested. So what P1 has to do is send data to P2. Uh, it says, here's the data, here's uh, the computation, go ahead and help me out. So I send uh, the first uh, array elements, and then I send half of the other elements that I want to the calculations done for. And then P1 and P2 can now uh, sort of start computing in parallel. But notice that P2 has its own array that it's going to store results in. And so as these comp uh, compute, they actually fill in different um, logical places or logical parts of the overall matrix. So what has to be done is at the end, for P1 to have all the results, P2 has to send it, uh, sort of the rest of the matrix to complete it. And so now P1 has all the results, the computation is done, and you can move on. Does that make sense? OK, so you'll, you'll get to actually do this as part of your labs. So in, the, in this example messaging program, you know, started out with a sequential code. And we had two processors. So processor one actually sends the code. So this is essentially a template for the code you'll end up writing. Um, and it does have to work in the outer loop. So this n array uh, 
over which it was iterating um, um, the A array is it's only doing half as many. And um, processor two has to actually receive the data and it specifies where to receive the data into. Uh, so I've omitted some things, for example, as to, uh, or extra information sort of hidden in these parameters. Uh, so here you're sending all of A, all of B, uh, whereas you, know, you could have specified extra parameters that says, um, you know, I'm sending you A, here's n elements to read from A, uh, here's B, here's uh, n by two elements to read from B, and so on. But the computation is essentially the same, except for the index at which you start, uh, in this case, I've, I've uh, changed for processor two. And now, when the computation is done, this guy essentially waits until the data is received. Processor two eventually sends it that data, and now you can move on. Yeah, so there's a, I'll get into that later. Um, so this receive, you know, what does it mean to receive? Can I, um, um, you know, to do this computation, I actually need this, completion, this instruction to complete. So what does it mean for that instruction to complete? Um, I do have to get the data because otherwise I don't know what to compute on. So there's some synchronization, <laughs> implicit synchronization that you have to do. And in some cases, it's, it's explicit. So I'll get into that a little bit later. Does that sort of hint at the answer? Or are you still confused? So, so in terms of tracing, right, processor one sends the data and then can immediately start executing its code. Right? Processor two has to wait until, in this particular example, has to wait until it receives the data. So once this receive completes, then you can actually go and start executing the rest of the code. Right? So imagine that there's a, essentially says, wait until I have data, wait until I have something to do. Does that help? Can the main processor? I mean, in, in, in cell, it's not everybody is not peer. There's a master there. Right. And what master can do it instead of doing computation, master can be the basically the quarterback, sending data, receiving data, and, and SPs can be basically waiting for data, get then compute, send it back. So in some sense, in, in, in cell, you don't you probably don't want to do the computation on the master. Because that means the master slows down, the master will do only the data management. So that might be one way of doing that. That's, this, this, it's not symmetric, everything is not symmetric. Yeah, yeah. And, and you'll see that in the example because the, the PPE in that case has to send the data to do different SPEs. Yep. In some sense, parts of this, the second, at least the receipt part, seems to be, at points, seems to be inconvenient in the sense that if, so let's say that you have a huge array and you want to start computing before you receive the whole array, then you have to do the explicitly pipeline everything. Whereas yeah, we'll, we'll get into that later. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good point. You know, communication is not cheap. And if you uh, uh, sort of don't take that into consideration, you end up paying a lot for the overhead for paralyzing things. Well, it, it, you can do things in software as well. I'll, I'll get into that. OK, so some crude performance analysis. So I, I have to calculate this distance. And given two processors, I can effectively get a 2x speed up. Uh, by dividing up the work, I can get done in, uh, in half the time. Well, if you gave me four processors, I can maybe get done uh, four times as fast. And in my communication model here, I have one copy of one array that I'm essentially sending to every processor. And there's some subset of A, so I'm partitioning uh, my other array into smaller subsets, and I'm sending those to each of the different processors. So we'll get into terminology for uh, how to actually name these communications later. Um, but really, the thing to take away here is that this granularity, how I'm partitioning A, affects my uh, performance and communication almost directly. And uh, you know, the, the comment that was just made is that you know, what do you do about communication? It's not free. So all of those will be addressed. So to understand performance, uh, we sort of summarize three main concepts that you essentially need to understand. One is coverage. Um, or in other words, how much parallelism do I actually have in my application? So, uh, and, and this can uh, actually affect you know, how much work is it worth spending on in this particular application. <coughs> Granularity, uh, you know, how do you partition your data among your different processors so that you can keep communication down, so you can keep synchronization down, and so on. Uh, locality, uh, so while not shown in, in the particular example, if two processors are communicating, 
uh, if they are close in space or far in space, or uh, if the communication between two processors is far cheaper than uh, two other processors, can I exploit that in some way? And so we'll talk about that as well. So an example of sort of parallelism in an application, um, there are two essentially projects uh, that are doing rate tracing, so I thought I'd have this slide here. Um, you know, how much parallelism do you have in a, in, in, uh, in a ray tracing uh, program? In trace tracing, what you do is uh, you essentially have some camera source or some, uh, 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 some observer, and you're trying to figure out you know, how to color uh, or how to shade different pixels in your screen. So what you do is you shoot rays from a particular source uh, through your plane, and then you see how the rays bounce off of other objects, and that allows you to render scenes uh, in various ways. So you have different kinds of parallelism. You, you have your, uh, your primary ray that's shot in, and if you're shooting into something like water or some very reflective surface um, or some surface that can uh, actually reflect, transmit, and uh, whoops, uh, you can essentially end up with a lot more rays that are created um, at runtime. Right? So there's dynamic parallelism in this particular example. And you can shoot a lot of rays from here, so there's uh, different kinds of parallelism you can exploit. But not all programs have this kind of uh, sort of a lot of parallelism or embarrassingly parallel uh, computation. There, you know, you, you saw some basic code sequences in earlier lectures. So there's a sequential part. And the reason this is sequential is because there are data flow dependencies between each of the different computations. So here I calculate A, but I need the result of A to do this instruction. I calculate D here, and I need that result to calculate E. Uh, but then this loop really here is just assigning or it's initializing some big array, and I can really do that in parallel. Uh, so I have sequential parts and parallel parts. So how does that affect my overall uh, speed ups? And so there's this uh, law, which is really a demonstration of diminishing returns, um, Amidal's law. It says that if you, know, you have a, a really fast car, uh, it's only as good as to you as fast as you can drive it. Uh, so if there's a lot of congestion on your road, or uh, you know, there are posted speed limits, or some other mechanisms, you really can't exploit uh, all the speed of your car. Or in other words, you're only as fast as uh, the fastest mechanisms of computation that you can have. So to look at this in, in uh, sort of more detail, your potential speed up is really uh, proportional to uh, the fraction of the code that can be paralyzed. So if I have some computation, let's say it has three parts, a sequential part that takes 25 seconds, a parallel part that takes 50 seconds, and a sequential part that runs 25 in 25 seconds. So the total execution time is 100 seconds. And if I have one processor, uh, that's really all I can do. But if you give me more than one processor, so let's say I have five processors, well, I can't do anything about the sequential work. So that's still going to take 25 seconds. And I can't do anything about this sequential work either. That still takes 25 seconds. But this uh, parallel part, I can essentially break up among the different processors, so five in this case. And that gets me you know, five-way parallelism. So the 50 seconds now is reduced to 10 seconds. Is that clear so far? So the overall running time in that case is 60 seconds. So what would be my speed up? Well, you calculate speed up, um, uh, old running time divided by the new running time. So 100 seconds divided by 60 seconds, or my parallel version is 1.67 times faster. So this is great. Uh, if I increase the number of processors, then I should be able to get more and more parallelism. But it also means that um, there's a sort of an upper bound on how much speed up you can get. So if you look at the fraction of work in your application, uh, that's parallel, and that's P, and your number of processors, well, your speed up is uh, let's say the old running time is just one unit of work. It's the time it takes for the sequential work. So it's 1 minus p, uh, since p is the fraction of the uh, parallel work. And it's the time to do the parallel work. And since I can parallelize um, that fraction over n processors, I can sort of reduce that to, uh, to really small amounts in the limit. Does that make sense so far? So the speed up can tend to 1 over 1 minus p in the limit. As I increase the number of processors, or that gets uh, really large, um, that's, uh, that's essentially my upper bound on how fast programs can work. Um, uh, you know, how, fa how much can I exploit out of um, my program? So this is great. What this law says, the implication here is, if your program has a lot of inherent parallelism, you can do really well. But if your program doesn't have any parallelism, well, there's really nothing you can do. Uh, 
So parallel architectures won't really help you. And there's some interesting trade-offs, for example, that you might consider if you're um, designing a chip or if you're looking at an application or domain of applications, figuring out what is the best architecture to run them on. So in terms of performance scalability, <coughs> as I increase the number of processors, uh, I have speed up. You can define sort of an efficiency to be linear <laughs> at 100%, but typically you end up in uh, sort of a sublinear domain. That's because communication uh, is not often free. And, but you, you can get super linear speed ups on real architectures because of secondary and tertiary effects that come from register allocation or caching effects. So they can hide a lot of latency or they can really, uh, you can take advantage of a lot of uh, pipelining mechanisms in the, in the architecture uh, to get super linear speed ups. So you can end up in uh, really in two different domains. Okay, so a small uh, you know, overview of um, the extent of parallelism in your program and how that affects your uh, overall execution. And th the other concept is granularity. So given that I have this much parallelism, how do I exploit it? So there are different ways of exploiting it, and that comes down to, well, how do I subdivide my problem? You know, what is the granularity of the subproblems I'm going to uh, calculate on? And really, granularity, uh, from my perspective, is just a qualitative measure of what is the ratio of your computation to your communication? So if you're doing a lot of computation, very little communication, uh, you could be doing really well. Or vice versa, then you could be computation limited, and so you need a lot of bandwidth, for example, in your, in your architecture. Yeah? Like before, you really didn't have to give every single processor a copy of, an entire copy of B. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So, um, and as you saw in, in the previous slides, you have computation stages are separ separated by communication stages. And the communication, in a lot of cases, essentially serves as synchronization. I need, to, I need everybody to get to the same point before I can move on logically in my computation. So there are two kinds of uh, sort of classes of granularity. There's fine-grained and, as you'll see, coarse-grained. So in fine-grained parallelism, you have low computation to communication ratio. And that has good properties in that uh, you have a small amount of work done uh, between communication stages. Um, and, uh, sorry, it has bad properties in that it gives you less performance opportunity. Wait, is there? Uh, it should be more, right? More opportunity for performance. Sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. I didn't get enough sleep. <laughs> Just in time slide creation. Uh, uh, so less opportunities for performance enhancement, but you have a high communication ratio because uh, es essentially you're communicating very often. So these are the computations here, and these yellow bars um, are the synchronization points. So I have to distribute data or communicate. Uh, I do computations, but uh, you know, computation doesn't last very long, and I do more, more communication or more synchronization, and I repeat the process. So naturally, you can adjust this granularity to sort of reduce the communication overhead. I want to add something. There's yeah. two things in that overhead part. One is the volume, so it's the amount of uh, uh, communication. Also, there's a large part of synchronization cost. Basically, to get a communication going, you have to go start the messages, and you have to wait till everybody's done. So that overhead also can go. Even if you don't send that much data, just the fact that you are communicating, that means you, are, you have to do a lot of this additional bookkeeping uh, stuff. That, that especially in the, in the distributed memory machine is pretty expensive. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so in coarse grained parallelism, uh, you sort of make the work chunks more and more so that you do the communication and synchronization less and less. Uh, and so that's shown here. You do longer pieces of work and have fewer synchronization stages. And uh, so in, this, in that regime, uh, that you can have more opportunities for uh, performance improvements, but the, thing, the tricky thing that you get into is uh, what's called load balancing. So if each of these different computations take differing amounts of time to complete, then what you might end up doing is a lot of people might end up idle as they wait until everybody's essentially reached their finish line. Yeah? If you don't have to acknowledge that something's done, can't you just say, okay, I'm done with the result, hand it to the initial processor and keep doing whatever? So you can do that in cases where that essentially uh, there is a mechanism or the application allows for it. Uh, but as I'll show, well, you won't see until the next lecture, there are dependencies, for example, that might preclude you from doing that. If everybody needs to reach the same point 
uh, because you're updating a large data structure uh, before you can go on, then you might not be able to do that. So think of updating, doing molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, you need everybody to calculate a new position before you can go on and calculate new kinds of force interactions. Right. But also there's pipelining. So what do you talk about is because you might want to get the next data while you're computing now. So when I'm done, I can start sending. So he's going to get back to you. So yep. you, can, you can overlap some of that. Yep. Yeah, because communication is such an intensive part, uh, there, are three, there are different ways of dealing with it. And that'll be right after load balancing. Um, so the load balancing problem is just an illustration. Um, and things that appear in uh, sort of this lightish pink uh, w will, harp it, will serve as sort of visual cues. This is the same color coding scheme that David's using in the recitations. So this is PPU code. Uh, things that appear in yellow will be SPU code. And these are just meant to essentially show you how you might do things like this on cell. Uh, just to help you along in picking up more of the syntax and functionality you need to, for your program. So in, in the load balancing problem, um, you essentially have, let's say, three different threads of, uh, uh, three different, uh, threads of computation. And so that's shown here, red, blue, and orange. And you've reached some communication stage. So the PPU program in this case is saying, uh, send a message uh, to each of my SPEs, to each of my different processors, that you're ready to start. And so now, once every, every processor gets that message, they can start computing. And let's assume they have data and so on uh, ready to go. And what's going to happen is each processor is going to run through the computation at different rates. Now, this could be uh, because one processor is faster than another, or it could be because one processor is more loaded than another, or it could be just because each processor is assigned uh, sort of a, a less, differing amounts of work. So one has a short loop, one has a longer loop. And so as the animation shows, sort of execution proceeds, and everybody's waiting until the orange guy has completed. Uh, but nobody could have made progress until um, everybody's reached synchronization point because uh, it, you know, there's a strict dependence that's being enforced here that says, I'm going to wait until everybody's told me they're done before I go on to the next step of computation. And so that's, uh, you know, in cell, you do that using mailboxes in this case. Is that clear so far? Okay. So how do you get around this load balancing problem? Um, well, the, there are two different ways. There's static load balancing. I know my application really, really well. And I understand sort of the different computations. So what I can do is I can divide up the work and have a static mapping of the work to my processors. Um, and static mapping just means, in, uh, as, you know, in this particular example, that I'm going to assign the work to different processors. And that's what the processors will do. Work can't shift around between processors. And so in this case, I have a work queue. Each of those bars is some computation. You know, I can assign uh, some chunk to P1, processor 1, some chunk to processor 2. And then computation can go on. Those, uh, those allocations don't change. So this works well if I understand the application well. I know what the computation. And my cores are relatively homogeneous. And you know, not, there's not a lot of contention for them. So if all the cores are the same, uh, each core has an equal amount of work, a total amount of work. This works really well because nobody's sitting too, too idle. It doesn't work so well for heterogeneous architectures or multi-cores because one might be faster than the other. It increases the complexity of the allocation I need to do. If there's a lot of contention for some resources, then uh, that can affect my, uh, the static load balancing. So work distribution might end up being uneven. So the alternative is dynamic load balancing. And you certainly could do a, sort of a hybrid load balancing, static plus dynamic uh, mechanism, although I don't have that in the slides. So in the dynamic load balancing scheme, uh, two different, uh, uh, two different uh, mechanisms I'm going to illustrate. So in the first scheme, you start with something like the static uh, mechanism. So I have some work going to processor 1. And I have some work going to processor 2. But then as processor 2 executes and gets uh, completes, uh, say, fast in processor 1, some of the work, it takes on some of the additional work from processor 1. So the work that was here is now shifted. And so you can uh, keep helping out you know, your other processors to compute things faster. In the other scheme, you have a work queue where you essentially are distributing work on the fly. So as things complete, you're just sending, in, sending them more work to do. So in this animation, you know, I start off, I send uh, work to different processors. P2 is really fast, so it's just zipping through things. And then P1 eventually finishes, and new work is allocated to, uh, to the two different schemes. 
So dynamic load balancing is just intended to uh, sort of give equal amounts of work in a different scheme uh, for processors. So you really increase utilization and spend less and less time being idle. OK, so load balancing <coughs> was one part of uh, sort of how granularity uh, can have a performance straight off. The other is synchronization. So there were already some good questions as to, well, um, you know, how does this play into overall execution? When can I wait? When can't I wait? So I'm going to illustrate it with just a simple data dependence graph, although you can imagine that in each one of these circles, there's some really heavy load computation. And you'll see that in the next lecture, in fact. So if I have some simple computation here, I have some operands. I'm doing an addition. Um, here I do another addition. I need both of these results before I can do this multiplication. Uh, here I have you know, some loop that's adding through some array elements. I need all those results before I do final subtraction and produce my final result. So what are some synchronization points uh, here? Well, it really depends on how I allocate these different instructions to processors. So if I have an allocation that just says, well, let's put all these chains on one processor, put these two chains on two different processors, well, where are my synchronization points? Well, it depends on where this guy is and where this guy is. Because for this instruction to execute, it needs to receive data from P1 and P2. So if P1 and P2 um, are different from uh, what's in that box, um, somebody has to wait. And so there's a synchronization uh, that has to happen. So I can uh, get rid of that synchronization. So essentially, at all join points, there's potential for synchronization. But I can adjust the granularity so that I can remove more and more synchronization points. And so, uh, you know, whoops, let's up in the animation. So if I had assigned all this, uh, this entire subgraph to the same processor, I really get rid of the synchronization because it's essentially local uh, to that particular processor. And there's no extra messaging that has to happen across processors that says, I'm ready, or I'm ready to send you data, or uh, you can move on to the next step. And so in this case, the last synchronization point would be at this join point, uh, let's say if it's allocated on P1 or on some other processor. So how would I get rid of this synchronization point? Right, you, you put the entire thing on a single processor, but you get no parallelism in this case. Right? So the coarse grain, fine grain, parallelism, granularity issue uh, comes to play. So the last uh, sort of thing I'm going to talk about in terms of how granularity uh, impacts performance, and this was already touched on, is that communication is really not cheap and uh, can be quite overwhelming on a lot of architectures. And what's interesting about multi-cores is that they're essentially putting a lot more resources closer together on a chip. So it's essentially changing, it's changing the factors for communication. Um, so rather than having you know, your parallel cluster now, which is connected, say, by Ethernet or some other high-speed link, now you essentially have uh, large clusters or will have large clusters on a chip. So communication factors really change. But the cost model is relatively uh, uh, captured or by these different parameters. So what does it actually take me, or what is the cost of my communication? Well, it's equal to, well, how, how many me messages am I sending, and what is the frequency with which I'm sending them? There's some overhead for a message. So I have to actually package data together. I have to stick in a control header um, and then send it out. So there, that takes me some work on the receiver side. I have to take the message, or maybe I have to decode the header. Uh, figure out where to store things, um, where, where to store the data that's coming in on the message. So there's some overhead associated with that as well. There's a network delay uh, for sending the message, so putting, thing, putting a message on the network uh, so that it can be transmitted or picking things up off the network. So there's a latency also associated with how long does it take for a message to get from point A to point B. Um, what is the bandwidth that I have uh, across a link? So if I have a lot of bandwidth, then I can really lower uh, my communication cost. But if I have little bandwidth, then I can really create contention. How much data am I sending? And uh, you know, number of messages. So this numerator here is really an average of the data that you're sending per communication. Um, there's a cost induced per contention. And then finally, there's, so all of these are additive factors. The, the, uh, the higher they are, except for bandwidth, because it's in the denominator here, the worse your communication cost becomes. So you can try to reduce the communication cost by uh, communicating less. So you adjust your granularity. <coughs> and that can impact uh, 
your synchronization over what kind of data you're shipping around. Um, you can do some architectural tweaks or maybe some software tweaks to really get the network latency down and the overhead per message down. So on something like the raw architecture, which you saw um, in Saman's lecture, there's a really fast mechanism to communicate nearest neighbor in three cycles. So one processor can send a single operand to another um, uh, reasonably fast. Uh, you know, you can improve the bandwidth, so again, an architectural mechanism. Um, you can do some tricks as to how you package your data in each message. Um, and lastly, what I'm going to talk about in, in, in a couple of slides is, well, I can also improve it using some mechanisms that try to increase the overlap between messages. And what does this really mean? What am I overlapping it with? And it's really the, the communication and computation stages are going to somehow get aligned. So uh, before I can show you that, uh, I just want to point out that there are two kinds of messages. Right? There's data messages. And these are, for example, the arrays that I'm sending around to different processors um, for that uh, distance calculations between points in space. But there are also control messages. Uh, so control messages essentially say, I'm done, or I'm ready to go, or um, is there any, any work for me to do? So on cell, control messages, you, know, you can think of using mailboxes for those, and the DMAs for doing the data communication. So data messages are relatively much larger. You're sending a lot of data versus control messages that are really much shorter, just essentially just sending you um, very brief information. Okay. So in order to uh, get that overlap, what you can do is essentially use this concept of pipelining. Uh, so you've seen pipelining in superscalar. Someone talked about that. And what you're essentially trying to do is break up the communication and computation into different stages and then figure out a way to overlap them so that you can essentially hide the latency for, for the sends and, uh, and receives. So let's say you have uh, some work that you're doing and really requires you to send the data or get it. For, somebody has to send you the data or you, uh, you essentially have to uh, uh, wait until you get it. And then after you've waited and the data is there, you can actually go on and do your work. So these are color coded. So this is essentially one iteration um, of the work. And so you can overlap them by breaking up the work into um, send, wait, work stages, where each iteration, I'm trying to send or request the data for the next iteration. I wait on the data from a previous iteration, and then I do my work. So depending on how I partition, I can really get really good overlap. And so what you want to get to is the concept of a steady t state, where in your main loop body, all you're doing is um, essentially prefetching uh, or requesting data that's going to be used in future iterations for future work. And then you, uh, you, you're waiting on, uh, yeah, I think my color coding is a little bogus. That's good. Okay, so here's an example of how you might do this kind of buffer pipelining in cell. Um, so I have some main loop that's going to do some work that's encapsulating this process data. And what I'm going to use is two buffers. So this scheme is also called double buffering. I'm going to use this ID to represent which buffer I'm going to use. So it's either zero, buffer zero, or buffer one. Uh, and this instruction here essentially flips the bit. So it's either zero or one. So I fetch data into buffer zero. And then I enter my loop. So this is essentially the first send, which is trying to get me one iteration ahead. So I enter this main loop, and I do some um, um, calculation to figure out uh, where to uh, write the next data. And then I do another request for the next data item that I'm going to. Uh, sorry, there's an M missing here. Just noticed it. Um, I'm going to fetch data into a different buffer. Right. This is ID where I've already flipped a bit once. So this get is going to write data into buffer 0. And this get is going to write data into buffer 1. I flipped a bit again. So now I'm going to issue a wait instruction that says, uh, has the data from buffer 0? Is the data from buffer 0 ready? And if it is, then I can go on and actually do my work. Does that make sense? People confused? Should I go over it again? OK. Uh, so this is an XOR. So uh, I could have just said buffer equals 0 or buffer equals 1. <coughs> oh, sorry. This is 1, yeah. yeah. So uh, this is a 1 here. And then um, last minute editing. Should, uh, did that confuse you? Okay. 
Uh, okay, so I'll go over here again. So this get here is going to write into ID zero. So that's buffer buffer zero, right? And then I'm going to change the ID. So imagine there's a one here. So now the next uh, next time I use ID, which is here, I'm trying to get the data, and I'm going to write it to buffer one. The DMA on the cell processor essentially says I can send this request off, and I can check later to see when that data is available. But that data is going to go into a different buffer, essentially B1, whereas I'm going to work on buffer 0, right? because I changed the ID back here. Now you get it? So I fetch data into buffer 0 uh, initially before I start the loop. And then I start working. Uh, I probably should have had an animation in here. Uh, so then you go into, uh, you go into your main loop. You, s you s try to start fetching into buffer 1. And then you try to compute out of buffer 0. But before you can start computing out of buffer 0, you just have to make sure that your data is there. And so that's what the synchronization is doing here. Hope that was clear. OK, so this kind of uh, computation and communication overlap uh, really helps in hiding the latency. And uh, it, it can be really useful in terms of improving performance. Um, and there are different kinds of communication patterns. Um, so there's point to point, and you can use these both for uh, data communication or control communication. And it just means that you know, one processor can explicitly send a message to another processor. There's also a broadcast that says, hey, I have some data that everybody's interested in, so I can just broadcast it to everybody on the network. Um, or a reduce, which is the opposite. that says, everybody on the network has data that I need to compute, so everybody send me their data. There's an all to all. Uh, which says all processors should just do a global exchange of, uh, of data that they have. And then there's a scatter and a gather. So a scatter and a gather are really different types of broadcasts. So it's uh, one to several or one to many, and gather, which is many to one. So this is useful when you're doing uh, computation that really is trying to uh, um, pull data in together, but only from a subset of all processors. So it depends on how you've partitioned your, your, pro your problems. So there's a well-known sort of message passing library specification called MPI that tries to uh, essentially implement, uh, that, that tries to specify um, all of these different communications and, uh, in, in order to sort of facilitate parallel programming. Its full feature actually has more uh, types of communications um, and more kinds of functionality than I showed on previous slides. Uh, but it's not a language or a compiler specification. It's really just a library that you can implement in various ways on different architectures. Uh, again, it's a same program, multiple data, um, um, or supports the SPMD model. And it works reasonably well for parallel architectures, for clusters, heterogeneous and uh, multi-cores, homogeneous multi-cores. Because really, all it's doing is just abstracting out. Uh, well, it's giving you a mechanism to abstract out um, all the communication that you would need in, in your computation. So you can have um, uh, additional things like pre precise buffer management. Uh, you can have uh, some collective operations. That I'll show you an example of um, for, uh, for doing things in a scalable manner when, you're a when, when a lot of things need to communicate with each other. So just a brief history of where MPI came from. And uh, you know, very early when you know, parallel computers started becoming uh, more and more widespread, and there were these networks, and people had problems porting their applications uh, or writing applications for these schemes just because it was difficult, as you might be finding in, in terms of programming things with the cell processor. Um, you know, there needed to be ways to sort of address the spectrum of communication. Uh, and it, it often helps to have a standard, because uh, if everybody implements the same standard um, specification, then it allows your code to be ported around from one architecture to the other. and so. MPI came around. Um, the forum was the forum was organized in 1992, and there had a lot of people participating in it from vendors, you know, people like IBM, uh, companies like IBM, Intel, and uh, uh, people who were interested in, or who had expertise in writing libraries, um, users uh, who who were interested in using these kinds of uh, uh, specification to to do their computations. So scientific um, um, people who were in the scientific domain. And it was finished in about 18 months. I don't know if that's a reasonably long time or short time, but considering you know, I think the MPEG-4 standard took uh, uh, a bit longer to do. Um, 
as a comparison point. I don't have the actual data. So a uh, point-to-point -point communication. And uh, again, a reminder, these, this is how you would do it on cell. Uh, these are uh, SPE uh, sends and receives. You have one processor that's sending data to another processor. <coughs> and uh, you have some network in between. And processor A can essentially send the data explicitly to processor 2. Uh, and the message in this case would include how the data is packaged, some other information such as the length of the data, um, destination, possibly some tags so you can identify the actual communication. And you know, there's a mapping, a natural mapping for, uh, for the actual functions on cell. Um, and there's a get for the send and a put for the receive. No, quite. Okay. Um, so there was a question of, well, how do I know if my data actually got sent? How do I know if it was received? And there's a, you know, you can think of a synchronous send um, and a synchronous receive or an asynchronous communication. So in the synchronous communication, you actually wait for a notification. So this is kind of like your fax machine. You, know, you put something into your fax, it goes out, and you eventually get a beep that says your transmission is OK. Or if it wasn't OK, then you, know, you get a message that says uh, you know, something went wrong. And you can redo your um, communication. In the asynchronous send, it's kind of like you. Most probably you can get a reply too. Yeah, you can get a reply. Thanks. In the asynchronous send, it's like you write a letter, you go put it in the mailbox, and you don't know whether it actually made it into the, uh, into the actual uh, postman's uh, bag and it was delivered to your destination or, um, uh, or if it was actually delivered. So you only know that the message was sent. Uh, you, know, you put it in the mailbox. Um, but you don't know anything else about what happened to the message along the way. There's also the concept of a blocking versus a non-blocking message. Uh, so this is orthogonal, really, to synchronous versus asynchronous. Um, so in blocking messages, uh, a sender waits until there's some signal that says the message has been transmitted. So this is, for example, if I'm writing data into a buffer, uh, that it, and the buffer essentially gets transmitted to somebody else, we wait until the buffer is empty. Um, and what that means is that somebody has read it on the, on the other end, or somebody has drained that buffer from somewhere else. The receiver, if he's waiting on data, well, he just waits. He essentially blocks until somebody has put data into the buffer. And you can get into potential deadlock situations. So you saw a deadlock with uh, locks in the concurrency talk. I'm going to show you a different kind of uh, deadlock example. Um, an example of a blocking uh, send on, on cell uh, allows you to use mailboxes. Um, or y you can uh, sort of use mailboxes for that. Um, mailboxes, again, are just for communicating short messages, really, uh, not necessarily for communicating data messages. So an SPE uh, does some work and then it writes out a message, um, <coughs> in this case, uh, to notify the PPU that, let's say, it's done. And then it goes on and does more work. And then it wants to notify the PPU of something else. So in this case, this uh, particular send will block because, let's say, the PPU hasn't drained this mailbox. It hasn't read the mailbox. So you essentially stop and wait um, until the PPU has, uh, has you know, caught up. So all mailbox sends are uh, blocking? Uh, yes. David says yes. Right. Um, okay. uh, a non-blocking send is something that essentially allows you to uh, put, send a message out and uh, just continue on. You don't care uh, exactly about what, uh, what's happened to the message or what's going on with the receiver. So you write the data into, into the buffer and you just continue executing. And this really helps you in terms of avoiding idle times and deadlocks, but it might not always be the thing that you want. So an example of uh, sort of a non-blocking uh, send and wait on cell is using the DMAs. Uh, to ship data out. You, know, you can put something, uh, put in a request to send data out on the DMA, um, and you could wait for it if you want in terms of um, making sure that, uh, reading the status bits to make sure it's completed. Anyway, so w what is the source of deadlock in the blocking case? And it really comes about if you don't really have enough buffering in your communication network. Um, and often you can resolve that by having additional storage. So let's say I have processor 1 and processor 2, and they're trying to send messages to each other. So processor 1 sends a message. At the same time, processor 2 sends a message. And these are going, 
are going to go, let's say, into the same buffer? Well, neither can make progress because um, somebody has to essentially drain that buffer before these receives can execute. So what happens with that code is it really depends on how much buffering you have between the two. If you have a lot of buffering, then you may never see sort of the deadlock. But if uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, if you have a really tiny buffer, then you, you do ascend. The other person can't do the send uh, because they are, uh, the buffer hasn't been drained. And so you end up with a deadlock. And so a potential solution is, well, you actually increase your buffer length. But that doesn't always work because you can still get into trouble. So what you might need to do is essentially be more diligent about how you order your sends and receives. So if you have uh, processor one doing send, make sure it's matched up with a receive on the other end. Uh, and uh, similarly, if you're doing a receive here, make sure there's sort of a matching send on the other end. And that helps you in sort of making sure that things are operating uh, reasonably in lockstep at uh, uh, you know, partially ordered times. Okay. Uh, broadcast mechanism. So I showed you that was uh, really uh, examples of point-to-point -point, uh, communication. A broadcast mechanism is slightly different. It says, I have data that I, that I want to send to everybody. It could be really efficient for uh, sending short control messages, maybe even efficient for sending data messages. Um, so as an example, if you remember our calculation of distances between all points, the parallelization strategy said, well, I'm going to send one copy of the array A to everybody. Um, and so in the two processor case, that was easy. But if I have n processors, then rather than sending point-to-point -point communication from A to everybody else, what I could do is just say, broadcast A to everybody, and they can grab it off the network. Uh, so in MPI, there's this directive, um, uh, or this function, MPI broadcast, that does that. I'm using sort of generic um, um, abstract sends, receives, and broadcast in my examples. So you can broadcast A to everybody, and then if I had n processors, then what I might do is distribute the m's in a round-robin manner to each of the different processors. So you, you pointed this out. I don't have to send b to everybody. I can just send, uh, you know, in this case, one particular element. Is that clear? Okay. There's no broadcast on cell. There is no broadcast on cell. There is no mechanism for a reduction either, uh, um, and. You can't quite do scale, uh, scatters and gathers, um, I, I don't think. OK, so an example of a reduction, uh, you know, I, I said it's the opposite of a broadcast. Everybody has data that needs to essentially get to the same point. Uh, so as an example, if everybody in this room had a value, and uh, including myself, and I wanted to know what is the collective value of everybody in the room, you all have to send me your data. Now, this is important because if, you know, in this case, we're doing an addition, it's an associative operation. So what we can do is we can be smart about how the data is sent. So you know, guys that are close together can essentially add up their numbers and forward me. So instead of getting n messages, I can get log n messages. And so if every pair of you added your numbers and forwarded me that, that cuts down communication by half. And so you can, uh, you know, starting from the back of the room, by the time you get to me, I only get two messages instead of n messages. So a reduction combines data from all processors. In MPI, it's, you know, there's this function MPI reduce for doing that. Uh, and uh, the collective operations are things that are associative. And, subtract, um, uh, sorry, uh, and, or, and, sorry, you can read them on the slide. Um, no processor, uh, th there's a semantic uh, caveat here is that no processor can finish uh, the reduction before all processors have at least sent it one data, or have contributed, uh, rather, uh, a particular value. So in many numerical algor algorithms, you can actually use the broadcast and send uh, the broadcast and reduce in, in place of sends and receives, because it really helps to improve the simplicity, of, or it improves the simplicity of your computation. Um, you, know, you don't have to do end sends to communicate data. You can just broadcast. It gives you a mechanism for essentially having a shared memory abstraction on distributed memory architecture. Um, there are things like all-to-all -all communication, which also help you in that sense, although I don't talk about all-to-all -all communication here. Um, so I'm going to show you an example of uh, sort of a more detailed MPI. Uh, but I also want to contrast this to the OpenMP uh, programming on shared memory processors, because one might look simpler than the other. So suppose that you have a numerical integration method that's essentially you're going to use to calculate pi. Um, 
So as you get finer and finer, you can get more accurate. Uh, you know, as you shrink these intervals, you can get better um, values for pi. And the code for doing that in you know, some uh, C code, you have some variables. And then you have a step that essentially tells you how many times you're going to do this computation. And for each time step, you calculate this particular function here. And you add it all up. And in the end, you can sort of print out what is the value of pi that you've calculated. So clearly, as, uh, you, know, as you shrink your intervals, you can get more and more uh, accurate measures of pi. So that translates to increasing the number of steps in, in that particular um, loop, or in that particular C code. So you can compute, uh, you can use that uh, numerical integration to calculate pi with OpenMP. And what that translates to is, sorry, it should have been an animation here. I ask you what I should add in. Um, you have this particular loop, and this is the, the computation that you want to parallelize. And there's really four questions that you essentially have to go through. Um, are there variables that are shared? Because you have to get the process right. If there are variables that are shared, you have to explicitly synchronize them. Uh, and uh, use locks to protect them. Um, what values are private? So in OpenMP, uh, things that are private are data on the stack, um, things that are defined lexically within the scope of um, the computation that you encapsulate by an OpenMP uh, uh, pragma, and what variables you might want to use for a reduction. So in this case, you know, I'm doing a summation, and this is the computation that I can parallelize, then I essentially want to do a reduction with a plus operator since I'm doing an addition on this variable. Um, this loop here is parallel. It's, it's uh, data parallel. I can split it up. It's uh, the loop. The for loop is also, um, I can do this work sharing on it. So I use the parallel for pragma. And the variable x here is private. Um, it's defined here, but I can essentially give a directive that says, this is private. You can essentially rename it on each processor. Its value won't have any effect on the overall computation because each computation will have its own local copy. All right, clear so far. Okay, so computing pi with integration using MPI takes up two slides. Um, I, you know, I could fit it on one slide, but you couldn't see it in the back. So there's some initialization. In fact, I think there's only six basic MPI commands that you need for computing. Uh, three of them are here, uh, and you'll see uh, you know, the others are MPI send, MPI receive, and there's one more uh, that you'll see on the next slide. So there's some loop that says, while I'm not done, uh, keep, uh, keep computing. And what you do is you broadcast n to all the different processors. n is really your time step. Uh, how many, things, how many uh, small intervals of execution are you going to do? And uh, you can go through, do your computation. So now this the MPI essentially encapsulates the computation over n processors. Um, and then you get to an MPI reduce uh, command at some point that says, OK, what, uh, what values did everybody compute? Do the uh, reduction on that. Write that value into my MPI. Now what happens here is um, there's processor ID 0, which I'm going to consider the master. So he's the one who's going to actually print out the value. So the reduction uh, essentially synchronizes until everybody's communicated a value to processor 0. And then it can print out the pi. And then you can finalize, which actually makes sure uh, uh, computation can exit. And you can go on and terminate. Okay. So last concept in terms of understanding performance for, parallelis for parallelism is this notion of locality. And there's locality in your communication and locality in your computation. Um, so what do I mean by that? So in terms of communication, um, you know, if I have some two operations, and let's say this is a picture or schematic of what the raw chip, the MIT raw chip looks like. Uh, each one of these is a core. There's some network, some basic uh, computation elements. And if I have you know, an addition that feeds into a shift, well, I can put the addition here and the shift there, but that means I have a really long path that I need to go to in terms of communicating that data value around. So the computation naturally should just be closer together because that uh, decreases the latency that I need to uh, communicate. So rather than doing that mapping, what I might want to do is just go to somebody who is close to me and available. Also, there are volume issues. So assume more than that, a lot of other people also want to communicate. So if, if it is randomly distributed, 
you can assume there's a lot more communication going into uh, in each, each channel. Whereas if you, if you put locality in there, then you, you can scale communication much better uh, than scaling the network. Uh, there's also a notion of locality in terms of memory accesses. And these are potentially also very important, um, uh, or more important rather, because of the latencies for uh, accessing memory. So if I have uh, you know, th this loop that's doing some addition uh, or some computation on an array, and I distribute it, say, over four processors, this is, a, again, a, let's assume a data parallel loop. So what I can do is have a work sharing mechanism that says, this thread here will operate on the first four indices. This thread here will operate on the f uh, next four indices, and next four, and the next four. And then you essentially uh, get to the join barrier, and then you can continue on. And if we consider wh how the access patterns are going to be generated uh, for, uh, for this particular loop, well, in the sequential case, I'm essentially generating them in sequence. So that allows me to exploit, for example, on traditional cache architecture, a notion of spatial locality. Uh, if I look at how things are organized in memory, in a sequential case, I can uh, perhaps fetch an entire block at a time. So I can fetch uh, all the elements of uh, A0 to A3 in one shot. I can fetch all the elements of A4 to uh, A7 in one shot. And that allows me to essentially improve um, performance because I overlap communication. I'm predicting that once I see a reference, I'm going to use data that's uh, adjacent to it in space. It's also a notion of temporal locality that says, if I use uh, some particular data element, I'm going to reuse it later on. Uh, I'm not showing that here. But in the parallel case, what could happen is, if each one of these threads is requesting a different data element, and let's say execution essentially uh, proceeds you know, all the threads are requesting their data in, uh, at, at the same time, then all these requests are going to end up going to the same memory bank. You know, spread, uh, the first thread is requesting ace of, uh, ace of 0. The next thread is requesting ace of 4. Next thread, ace of 8. Next, uh, next thread, ace of 12. And all of these happen to be in the same memory bank. So what that means is you know, there's a lot of contention for that one memory bank. And in effect, I've serialized the computation. Right? Everybody see that? And you know, this can be a problem in that you can essentially serial, fully serialize the computation uh, in that you, you know, there's contention on the first bank, contention on the second bank, and then contention on the third bank, and then contention on the fourth bank. And so I've done absolutely nothing uh, other than pay overhead for parallelization. Uh, I've you know, made extra work for myself in creating new threads. Uh, maybe I've uh, done some uh, extra work in terms of synchronization. Um, so I'm fully serial. So what you want to do is actually reorganize the way data is laid out in memory so that you can uh, effectively get the benefit of parallelization. So if you have uh, the data organized as is there, you can shuffle things around. And then you end up with a fully parallel uh, or a layout that's more amenable to full parallelism because now each thread is going to a different bank. And that essentially gives you four-way parallelism. And so um, you get the performance benefits. So there are different kinds of, uh, sort of uh, uh, considerations you need to take into account for uh, shared memory architectures uh, in terms of how the design affects the memory latency. So in a uniform memory access architecture, every processor has, is either, you can think of it as being equidistant from memory, or another way, it has the same access latency for getting data from memory. Most shared memory architectures are non-uniform, so uh, uh, also known as NUMA architecture. So you have physically partitioned memories. And the processors uh, can have the same address space, but the placement of data affects the performance because going to one bank versus another can be uh, uh, faster uh, or slower. So what kind of architecture is cell? Yeah. No guesses? It's not shared memory. <laughs> right, it's not a shared memory architecture. OK, so summary of parallel performance factors. So there's three things I tried to cover. Um, coverage, of ex, you know, coverage or the extent of parallelism in your application. So you saw Amidal's law and actually gave you a, sort of a model that said 
when is, when is parallelizing your application going to be worthwhile? And it really boils down to how much parallelism you actually have in your particular algorithm. If your algorithm is sequential, then there's really nothing you can do for uh, parallel uh, programming f um, for uh, performance using parallel architectures. Um, talk about granularity of the data partitioning uh, and the, the granularity of the work distribution. You know, if you had really fine-grained things versus really coarse-grained things, how does that translate to different communication uh, costs? And then the uh, last thing I showed was locality. Uh, so if you have near neighbors talking, that, that may be different than uh, two things that are further apart in space communicating. Um, and th there are some issues in terms of the memory latency and how you actually um, uh, can uh, take advantage of that. So this really is an overview of sort of the parallel programming concepts uh, and the performance implications. So the next lecture will be, uh, you know, how do I actually parallelize my program? And we'll talk about that.